And we are happy to welcome to our studio Brandon Gibson. He is a double lung transplant recipient. And beside him, Dr. Elizabeth Tullis, who is the head of respirology at St. Michael's Hospital here in Toronto. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. No, no, I mean really. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. You really are good, eh? Yes. Uh, let's start uh, telling a bit of your story. At what point in your life, how old were you, when uh, CF became part of your daily routine? Um, well, I was diagnosed with CF when I was about three months old. And uh, I kind of, yeah, I've lived with it my whole life. And uh, I've done a lot of um, treatments and things like that. And um, I mean, it really didn't take its big toll until I became about 10 or 11 years old. That's when it really hit me. And you said it really hit you, meaning what? Uh, meaning, I played hockey up until that point, but um, when I became 10, it just became too hard to breathe and I couldn't play hockey anymore. We said in the intro, you, 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 I think you described it as, it's like breathing through a straw. Yes. All the time. Yes. So you just can't get breath. Yes, that's what it is. Just constantly not being able to breathe. You are how old now? Are you 15? 18. 18? Yes. Okay, you're 18 now, so you have been dealing with this for way too long. Yes. <laughs> but you're finally living kind of a normal life now. Yes, I am. And we'll get to that in a second. All right, let's get the medical background to this. What is CF? Well, it's a genetic condition, which means that you're born with it and you inherit it from your parents. And it's a condition that involves different parts of the body, but mostly the lungs and the digestive tract. And you've got too much mucus and that kind of stuff on your lungs? That's right. Your mucus is dehydrated and thick and sticky, so it stays stuck in your lungs and it tra tra bacteria is trapped in the lungs. And the thick mucus in the digestive tract stops the the di digestive organs from working properly, so you don't um, absorb your food and your nutrients properly. We need that mucus though, right? I mean, in, in the proper amounts. Absolutely. Because it does what? So the purpose of mucus in your lungs is to trap the bacteria and the dirt from the air and then move it out of the lungs. And the problem with people with CF is because of the defect in the gene, their mucus is too thick and sticky. So it traps the mucus and the bacteria just fine, but then it doesn't move it out of the lungs. So then you've got bacteria um, and, and you know, inflammation in the lungs, damaging the lungs over and over and over every day, you know, 24 hours a day for your entire life. And just so you know, people watching us don't immediately panic, wondering you know, whether they're susceptible to this or not. If mom is a carrier and dad is a carrier of the CF gene, mm -hmm. what's the likelihood that their offspring will have it? It's about one in four. So 25% chance if both parents are carriers. And if you think about it, sort of, you know, how many children are born with CF, it's about 1 in 3,000, 1 in 3,300 babies born will have cystic fibrosis. But 1 in 25 people in Canada will be carriers of the CF gene. No signs or symptoms, but if they marry another carrier and have a child, there's a 25% chance that that child will have CF. Can, do you have a screening method for it? Well, it, we do, and actually Ontario and um, uh, uh, Alberta and now BC and shortly thereafter the other provinces will be starting newborn screening. So that means babies at the time of their birth, when they have their blood sample taken, will be screened for cystic fibrosis. So now we can diagnose CF when a child is just a few weeks old. Okay. Brandon, let's try and get some better understanding of how you've managed this thing through your whole life. You mentioned you were pretty young when you first had to deal with it. Yes. So what, what, what were the daily requirements of living with CF like for you? Well, uh, a lot of um, treatments in terms of I'd wake up and take medicine as soon as I woke up. And I did um, a mask treatment. I got um, some medicine through a, an inhalation. And then I would do a PEP, which is a physiotherapy for my lungs. And I would repeat, repeat that about three times a day. And um, that would be my everyday cycle. And, how many pills would you have to take over the course of a day? Um, up to about 25 to 30 pills. Every day? Yes. For year after year after year? Yes. Um, you know, I would imagine trying to keep a good attitude and a positive view of the future is hard to do when you're dealing with this. Was it for you? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, my, I'm very lucky to have very um, nice and... F I'm very fortunate to have very good parents that helped me through a lot, but it was very um, a tough time for me. I just met your mom and your sister, and they seemed like they were in your corner for this whole thing, obviously. Yes, they were. They yeah. helped me out a lot. But there, what, what did you do in those times when you just thought, I'm sick of living like this, and I don't want to do it anymore? Um, those times came a lot. I don't like the short a lot, but uh, they came more often than not. And um, I mean, for me, it was just mostly sitting and listening to music and things like that would really help. But um, I talked to my parents a lot about it. and. Um, but uh, they really did help me in that and 
just really trying to collect myself and um, yeah. What music? Um, a lot of like Headley and Simple Plan and things like that. And uh, it just really helped me kind of take a deep breath and get ready for the next day. You ever try Frank Sinatra? No. Frank is great. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Uh, 2006, you had a double lung transplant. Yes. How long were you on a waiting list for that procedure? Um, I was on the list for about 13 months. 13 months. So once you, once you discover that you're a candidate for this, the clock starts ticking, basically. Yes. And if you don't get the transplant, what happens? Um, you eventually just keep getting worse, and um, obviously it has you to eventually pass. Like eventually you're going to die from this, right? Yes. You don't live a nice, long, normal life. Yes. Did they give you any sense about how long you could live if you did not get the transplant? Um, my doctor had told me about uh, maybe two more years. You had two years to live? Yes. That's one hell of a ticking time bomb inside you. Yes. Any false calls when, yes, we've got, uh, we've got some organs, get down to the hospital right away? Uh, yes, we had one uh, false call. I was waking up uh, to go to school one morning and the pager went off and uh, we headed down to the hospital and we waited around for about an hour and a half and then uh, they said no, the lungs were no good. So uh, What was no good about them? Um, I'm not, they didn't really explain to me what was no good about them, but uh, we just knew that they weren't suitable for me and then it, it would have made me worse if I would have got them. So, Elizabeth, what was the problem there? They're not a good match because what? Well, there's a few issues. The first one is only about 15% of lungs are in good enough condition for um, donation. So the problem is the lungs are really fragile, and most of the kinds of injuries that cause brain death that would allow someone to be a donor are ones that may injure the lungs. So motor vehicle injury, et cetera, could have damage to the lungs. So the lungs are really fragile. And so if they're not in good condition, then if you put them into a donor, they won't work properly. And then as Brandon said, you'd be worse off than you were before. So there's actually a lot of research going on in how to make lungs better in order to improve the chances of a good recovery after transplant and allow us to use more uh, donor lungs. And that's one of the sort of new developments that is coming up. This is a weird question, Brandon, so hang in there with me, okay? Is it a bit odd knowing that you have to kind of hope that somebody else dies a miserable premature death in order that you get a set of lungs that will help give you life? Um, yes, my mom and I actually uh, spoke about that as soon as I was put on the list and it's kind of, it's a very eerie feeling and it's weird to think about and uh, it was definitely a bittersweet time when I got my transplant because um, we knew unfortunately someone else had to die for me to get my gift of life and, um, but it was, it's very unfortunate when you think about it. Do you know whose lungs you got? Uh, no, I do not. Do you want to know? I would like to know. I would really like to express my gratitude to that family. They, they saved my life. They really did. But it was all anonymous? Yes. So you eventually, the pager goes off and eventually you got the right match, Yes. right? You go down to the hospital. How long were you in surgery for? Um, for about six hours. Six hours? Yes. I hope they gave you more than just local anesthetic. <laughs> they <Yes>. did. <laughs> okay, good. Do you know what they did? Um, uh, to, to a certain point, yes. I mean, uh, I know they took out my new lungs and kind of slipped, uh, took out my old ones, sorry, and kind of slipped the new ones in and... Uh, did you ever see the old ones? I didn't, I, would, I was actually, talking to them about that as well. It, what, what would have been like to see them. And, uh, the surgeon kind of explained to me they were just kind of very, they were almost black in a sense, like they were just very disgusting and beat up. And Where's your scar? Uh, right across my chest, right here. Straight across? Yes. And how's it look? Um, looks good, it's looking good. <laughs> <laughs> nice and uh, pink, not so much uh, red and bloody like it was, but um, yeah. Does it ever go away, Elizabeth? It fades, like all yeah. scars, so yeah. eventually it's a thin white line. And, you know, I, we don't necessarily have to get too graphic here, but you, you cut them across, and then what do you do? <laughs> well, I don't do that because no, I'm but, a respirologist. Right. The surgeons do. But they actually take out one lung and put in one new lung. And while they've taken out one lung, the person's living on their only one lung in their heart. So that's a really delicate time and the surgeons and the anesthetists have to be very clever to kind of keep somebody going at that point. And then when they've hooked up one new lung, then they go and take out the second old lung and put the new one in. So it's sort of one after the other sequentially, two single lung transplants. And how, do you, how much time before you know whether it takes? Well, immediately they can see some aspects and see how the oxygen level in the blood is, et cetera. But the first sort of 72 hours are, are really key in seeing how the organ will function. Is he on medication now? Yes. Will yes. you be for the rest of your life? Yes, I will. You will be. Uh, not 25 or 30 pills a day, though. 
Um, it's almost up to that point. Is but that it's, right? It's uh, a pretty small price to pay, I think. <laughs> huh. Okay. Elizabeth, what percentage of people who need this procedure get this procedure? Well, I think in Canada, it's about 20% of people waiting for a lung transplant die on the waiting list. So that's one out of five. That's a, that's a big number. And there are a lot of people waiting each year. I think there's been about 300 or so people who have died in the last 10 years waiting for a lung transplant. Biggest problem is? Um, donors. There's just, you know, we don't have enough donors for the people who need the lungs. And, uh, and, and so that's the biggest challenge. I confess I'm not sure what the system is here. I, 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 do you have to indicate on your driver's license or something that you want to donate or is there an Correct. automatic assumption? Correct. In, in Canada, you have to express that you want to donate. Some countries in the world, it's automatically assumed. It's sort of the negative option. You right. have to say you don't want to. Should we have that here? Well, I mean, if you're, a if you're like me and you're a doctor that looks after people with CF, absolutely. <laughs> Now let's get a better sense about how your life is different. So you're telling us earlier that at a certain point you couldn't play anymore, you couldn't do anything, you just didn't have the breath for it. Yes. How about now? Uh, now, I mean, I do everything I possibly can. I, pay, uh, I play uh, hockey, I play lacrosse, I like to cycle, and I do a lot more than I did. It's a very nice life I live. When you compare your life now to your friends, do you have essentially the same life? I do. I mean, I go out with them and I get called to hang out just like they do and it's just it's very nice and um, even for now I can kind of see myself taking it for granted and I try not to and I try to think of what it used to be like and I should really take not take it for granted and you can play hockey yes do you hit I try <laughs> you try <laughs> so you're you're I mean you're as normal as the next kid in terms of your health yes you don't worry about your your scar opening up or anything like that nope huh okay uh, living with CF mm -hmm. today versus say a half a century ago What's the biggest difference? Huge difference. I think the biggest one is that in 1960, if you had a child born with CF, you were told that there was a very good chance they wouldn't make it to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So the life expectancy has improved dramatically in sort of the last 50 years. In fact, probably more than any other illness. So in 1960, your life expectancy was around four years, your median survival, and now it's 45 years in Canada. So there's an improvement of 40 years in just 50 years of looking after people with CF. And those advances are from research and better understanding of the defect in CF and better treatments for CF and the establishment of CF centers where there's you know, a team of physiotherapists and dietitians and nurses and doctors working with people with CF to help keep them well. And so we've seen truly dramatic improvements. When I started 20 years ago, I mean, there, the majority of people with CF were children. And now in Canada, 57% of people with CF are over the age of 18. So it's, the whole face of the illness has changed. But it's still, it's still a horrible disease. And half the people with this illness will die before they're 45 years old. So we've improved, but we're not there yet. This is one of those diseases, though, that presumably, you know, starting today, nobody need get. Isn't that right? I mean, if you're, if, if you're, it takes two people who are carriers of this gene, this genetic defect, I guess I can put mm -hmm. it that way, to have kids for it to, to happen again, right? Yes. So if people who are carriers don't have kids, you could wipe it out tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow, but, but you know what I'm saying. yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we don't have carrier screening in the population yet. We have newborn screening, so we can detect children with CF, and then that allows their parents to make reproductive decisions about second and third and fourth children, so to prevent people having um, more children with CF. So there's, there are options, reproductive options, to do that. Um, but we're still... You know, I think we're still going to be living with CF for a long time, so it's up to the researchers to find better ways to, uh, to treat it. Since you've been through this, uh, I think this is a good question to end on. What advice would you give other people who are around your age who are dealing with this and who, you know, from time to time have those thoughts of, I don't want to deal with this anymore? Um, I think the biggest advice I give them is just to stay strong and um, definitely talk to people. I think the worst thing you can do is kind of sit there and really feel sorry for yourself. I think you have to kind of lift your spirits up by talking to people. And I mean, my mom, she was the biggest help for me. And I think that you really have to talk to the people that are closest to you. And they really will make you feel a lot better about it. And um, I mean, try to look forward to the outcome. Don't kind of look at it as, oh, it's my transplant. Kind of look at it, oh, it's my transplant. 
like I'm, I can do it, right? Be very positive, and I think everything's going to go very smoothly. Brandon, it's a pleasure to meet you. you as well. And I wish you a long and happy life. Thank you. As I'm sure all our viewers do as well. And Elizabeth Tullis from St. Mike's Hospital, thanks so much for coming in tonight. Appreciate it.